are listening to the Revolutionary Road Radio Show. And I am your host, Bruce Wright. A little bit different opening. We decided to try something different. But we are going to, of course, always have Crown in our show as well as uh, his theme song. But I thought about this uh, particular song by this band because uh, it's about policing the world. And, you know, as we look at today, by the way, happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day. As we look at this whole notion of policing the world... And uh, you just heard in the prior newscast, by the way, about uh, the crumbling situation in Yemen. And, of course, uh, another puppet state of the United States, that is the government there. Uh, I'm reminded of Dr. King's uh, speech about Beyond Vietnam, which we're going to play a segment of that later in the show. But I am your host, Bruce Wright of the Revolutionary Road Radio Show, along with Connie Burton, who I believe is on the line Barb will be in the studio with me in just a moment. Uh, Mark is at the helm on the engineering end of things. And Crown uh, may or may not be able to call in tonight. I know he was somewhat busy. But I do have a guest that gives us some frequent commentary uh, from uh, New York City. Uh, He lives in the Bronx. And that's my good buddy Pete. So we'll be hearing from him later. Uh, But we have a very interesting show in honor of Dr. King today. Uh, We have what I believe to be... The one true uh, prophet in our modern time that is uh, reminiscent of Dr. King. And uh, I know he would say he stands in the shadow of Dr. King. But I am really, uh, in my opinion anyway, I believe that uh, the person you're going to hear from in a little bit is definitely someone uh, who I think is the most reminiscent of Dr. King in our modern era. And that's Dr. Cornell West, uh, poet professor, activist, uh, muckraker, and civil and human rights leader, as well as, uh, as I mentioned, a prolific author. And we're going to be playing a, um, a interview that, a very exclusive interview that we did, uh, that is uh, James, who's my uh, tech guy, and myself, did uh, at the speech he did last Wednesday at Mount Zion AME Church. And it was a... Uh, It was a barn raiser for sure and what he had to say. And uh, we're excited about being able to play the interview as well as part of his speech. And as I mentioned later in the show, we're going to also play a segment of Dr. King's Beyond Vietnam. And as always, uh, Connie is online and on tap to share her thoughts on things. Are you there, Connie? Yes, I am. How are you? Wonderful, wonderful. What did you do today for Dr. King Day? Anything well, particular? Of course, I, I was able to go to the uh, parade here in Tampa, and prior to the parade, I had an opportunity to participate in small circles of discussions about uh, King and where we should go from here. So it's been a good day for me. Yeah, we had a very good day too. The uh, organization that I'm co-director of, My Place in Recovery Faith Community. Uh, As part of in-service day for Dr. King, uh, we participated in the community in a block party. We're located in South St. Pete, and we had a uh, barbecue going on, along with a number of other groups doing a barbecue, and we had a free giveaway. Uh, Basically, everything in our thrift store was free that day so that any family in need or individual in need could get whatever they needed or whatever we were able to give them. And so that was kind of a neat opportunity. Uh, We did not participate in the parade. Uh, I do know that the people involved with Black Lives Matter had a contingent in the parade. I actually had uh, wanted to be part of that contingent but was unable, but was with them and had the opportunity to speak uh, on Saturday when we did the march uh, down Central Avenue from 31st Street all the way to Vinoy Park. In -hmm. fact, I have some... uh, Segments from that I'll probably play at some point. I know Mark was also there, and he recorded some things I'm sure he'll be playing during his show. And it was just an amazing opportunity. Uh, We had a die-in at least three times, uh, blocking traffic. It's amazing that the police, I think the police in St. Petersburg are taking a bit of a cautious stance at this point because they don't uh, want to see, uh, at least... You know, I'm assuming this, want to see some of the same kind of behaviors that other police departments have had. Who knows, though? Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, that was an amazing blessing. Uh, Friday night we had a huge benefit concert with some uh, 
punk bands that are very political, and they talked about Ferguson and Dr. King. It was amazing. I actually had the opportunity to speak there. We had almost uh, 800 young people at the Cuban Club. And then Thursday night, we had a film showing, an amazing documentary series that was released in 1971. Several uh, people appeared in it, including um, uh, Sidney Poitier um, and uh, Paul Newman and um, uh, Harry Belafonte, a whole uh, series of actors and people known in the community. And it was called From Montgomery to Memphis, and it was just footage of you know a lot of footage people have never seen of dr king because we 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 tend to i guess exalt him to the point where we don't recognize his humanity and unfortunately uh we don't recognize a lot of uh, some of the things that he shared later and uh, we showed parts of the film that focus on the latter part of dr king's uh ministry and that included uh the Chicago marches, the Poor People's Campaign uh, build up, and of course the Memphis strikes, and naturally that led to his assassination by the federal government. And yes, folks, I said that uh, because I think anybody who has any sense now has to admit at some level the federal government was involved in the assassination of Dr. King, involved in the assassination of both Robert and Bobby Kennedy, or Bobby Kennedy and John Kennedy. And Malcolm X, and certainly uh, Bobby Seal, or not Bobby Seal, we've had him on our show, but uh, uh, Fred Fred Hampton Jr. and others uh, mm-hmm. uh, of the Black Panther Party, as well as the American Indian Movement, uh, those who've been shot. So it's been a very busy week, Connie, and um, you know, uh, next month, uh, during Black History Month, we're going to continue some of the speeches by Cornell West. Um mm-hmm. Uh, next week, we've also got a special guest on for the whole hour, Rivera Sun, who's a prolific author of the book, The Dandelion, Resur- Dandelion Insurrection. She's actually going to be uh, in town next week and uh, talking about nonviolence, creative nonviolence in the uh, sense uh, and spirit of Dr. King. Um, so we have this segment, uh, and I'm pretty excited about playing this. I've always wanted to have a little bit more of an in-depth interview with Cornell West, uh, Cornel West is kind of an interesting character because while he may be a bit older now, he has had his hands not only in writing and poet and uh, academia and activism, but he is a prolific poet and has even had some involvement in the hip hop scene, which uh, I find pretty cool. Um, Connie, have you heard Cornell before? Um, not. No, not live. You know, I always catch him on the television, uh, some little snippet of his um, his wonderful talents. But, you know, I haven't had an opportunity to hear him live yet. Well, we were really excited to be there and to get in there and do the interview we did was just, uh, I don't know. It, I'm still, you know, you know, I don't want you don't want to be like some of these people uh, that are starstruck, and it isn't so much starstruck, but this is a man that I think is a giant of our time. There's not a lot of that going on anymore since so many, uh, not just civil rights leaders, but uh, leaders of the anti-war movement and other movements of the 60s, uh, to coin a phrase, have uh, not sold out, but bought in. And really it's the same thing as saying sold out. Uh, So it's nice to hear voices that aren't sold out. I I really believe that Dr. King in some level would have not really, he would have eschewed the notion of a holiday after him. He would have wanted the meaning of it to be so at the forefront of people. But unfortunately, often today, that's not the case. And unfortunately to say during the MLK parade, uh, several friends of mine, I wasn't there, but I did see it last year too were somewhat disgusted because it becomes such a big giant money-making venture. Um, you have police leading it followed by military and bail bondsmen. I mean, Dr. King would be disgusted at some of what this celebration has become. Unfortunately, I think what we have to do, those of us consciously have an understanding of King's philosophy, ideology. We have to turn, turn the ship a way in which, you know, America and our local legislative bodies would like for us to remember King. Uh, Mm -hmm. They don't want us to remember King as someone who uh, stood up for the rights of the poor, 
Uh, they don't want us to remember King as being, especially when we are in the midst of so many wars here in America. Uh, they don't want us to talk about the King's position against police violence, uh, housing discrimination. So those of us that uh, have a love for King, we have a responsibility to put out the correct the correct line of Dr. King. So when people are trying to do all these parades and then you say the merchants is on the front line and all we have is, you know, this um, glossing over of his work, we have to stop and say, no, this is not the King. This is not Dr. King. That's right. This is not his body of work. And especially when we are in these pressing times that we see, you know, legislative bodies is trying to uh, identify people and pin them as being worthless to society. Well, we have these huge uh, military budgets. Well, we have this huge incarceration of young lives that's uh, just being warped off to nothing. Well, we have this functional educational system. We have a responsibility to speak against these evils. And King was able to do it in nonviolent ways that exposed America to the whole world. So I think that in itself is enough to unite us uh, uh, to, to, to continue the legacy of King because we have all of these social ills that is unraveling again. And we don't have to just wait to be given permission. We don't have to wait until someone is assassinated to say we should do something. That's so true, Connie, so true. And I think you're going to hear some of that in uh, Cornell West's thoughts, both from the interview and the speech we're going to play. By the way, I wanted to give a special shout-out to my wife as well, Barb, because uh, tomorrow's her birthday, and I, I think you know it's important, too, to recognize the everyday people that work for human rights, and my wife has been involved in that for many years, along with so many others, including yourself, Connie. And, uh, and you know, the only thing, let me just say this, the only regrets I have about in participating in, you know, about the King's celebration is that we leave out the many hundreds of people, thousands mm -hmm. of people that was on the front end of pushing this wagon for the cause of civil rights for African people. That's so you know, true. the countless people that was, you know, lynched, <laughs> uh, uh, mm -hmm. beaten, maimed, killed, hung, lost property, houses was bombed. You know, we don't know those individuals. We don't call out their names. And then, too, we don't even identify. I'm thinking about Sister Ella Baker. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about Fannie Lou Hamer. I'm thinking about uh, Elijah Muhammad. I'm thinking about, you know, Brother Malcolm. I'm thinking about Fred Hampton. Because it, Make your they was part of, yes, they was part of that mix. I'm thinking about Coretta Scott King, you know. So while, you know, people try to get us to focus on this one person, he wouldn't have wanted us to focus on just him because it was a combination and effort of all of these individuals that got us to this point. Absolutely. So true. So true. And um, with that in mind, uh, we're going to go ahead and play the interview. Uh, Mark, do you have that ready for us? All right, this is an interview, exclusive interview, that uh, James and myself did with, and also uh, WMF was there, with uh, Dr. Cornell West, prolific author, activist, uh, professor, and hip-hop poet. Here we go. All right. Well, we're here at uh, Bethel AME. No. Um, excuse me. Greater Mount Zion. Greater Mount Zion uh, AME. Uh, tonight in St. Petersburg, and we are here with uh, Dr. Cornell West. We're privileged to have him in our community. And uh, Professor West, um, just a couple of uh, quick questions, and I'm sure WMNF may want to ask as, as well. Um, much of what's been going on, of course, recently in the news with what happened in Ferguson and New York has brought to attention concerns about the need to break the divide that exists both not just with law enforcement but in general with institutional ra racism uh, would you uh, comment on that for us 
No, I think one thing to keep in mind is that Ferguson allows us to witness this magnificent awakening among young people, all people, but especially among young people to straighten their backs up and to struggle, not just in the name of justice, but it's in the, it's in the name of respect. I think that uh, black people, all we've ever wanted in America and is a fair chance and respect. And I think black young folk are tired of being disrespected. Now, arbitrary police power is one example of that. We can talk about schools, we can talk about workplaces, we can talk about Hollywood and ugly stereotypical images and so forth. But this issue of respects is at the center of it, and that's a wonderful thing to uh, to see. And, and thank God this, this is true for now. Uh, all sectors, all cultures in American society, black lives matter, respect black people. Well, please. Oh, mm -hmm. hi there. It's, it's an absolute How pleasure you doing? to meet you. Oh, nice to see you. I'm a little starstruck. <laughs> Um, so, I, I, and this is this is my own leap of uh, of logic here, but in some respects, you could see Bill De Blasio almost as an Obama 2.0. Mm -hmm. um, yet, for for obvious reasons, uh, he hasn't been able. Not, maybe not so obvious. And that's my question to you. He cannot get the NYPD, and or I would assume the larger uh, metropolitan area to really get down to the nitty gritty of some of these systemic racial problems in New York. What do you see is maybe the blockage there or blockage here? And I think that any time you have a possibility of a new day being birthed, that there's going to be a lot of pain that goes with that birth. And uh, you've got the slices of the police department who are part of an older age. It's a bygone era. And so you get a certain kind of noise made, certain kind of pain expressed because they are legions to an older era. That older era was one in which there was arbitrary police power across the board, especially the poor youth, black and brown especially. And uh, when many of us said we don't want that any longer, uh, we knew that there would be strong backlash when we're witnessing that backlash. There's no doubt. But you have to work through it. And the question is going to be whether de Blasio has the backbone. Because that's always a fundamental question for any leader. Clinton, Obama, Bushes or whatever, what kind of backbone do they have in terms of integrity? And uh, de Blasio right now, he's got to show real backbone. Where would you think that we should, we, as Michelle Alexander points out, and, and this is very simplified, one, a, a lot of uh, uh, black and brown people are being uh, men, are being arrested for um, trumped up, not necessarily trumped up charges, but they're, they're preemptive charges, mandatory sentencing, and then once they get on the back end of it, they've lost their civil liberties. And if you were suggesting to take the first bite of this elephant to eat it, where, where would you start? Well, you got to raise the question, what does fairness require? Fair policing across the board, respecting persons across the board. Right now, we got a racist criminal justice system, so it's unfair. But somehow, we've got to make it fair. Same is true in terms of, I think, Michelle Alexander's really written the secular uh, Bible of our time because it focuses on this very ugly, uh, deeply racist uh, new Jim Crow in place. And uh, I mean, there, I think what she's saying is there has to be both fairness but also accountability. So you're not going to have accountability of arbitrary police power until some of the policemen go to jail. Not because you want to be vengeful, but because they've done something that violates the law. And the law has to apply equally across the board, including the blue in New York City. So, and that's what the police, that's the culture the police don't want to come to terms with that. They don't want that accountability. And that's where we're going to find out whether de Blasio has real backbone. Uh, gentlemen, I'm sorry. Well, one last quick question, please. Yeah, please. Uh, Dr. West, uh, it, with the emergence of the movement that has grown out of Ferguson, mm -hmm. are we seeing a new revolutionary youth movement that is happening and emerging in this country? Well, certainly a progressive awakening. I mean, revolutionaries is a very, uh, very tight uh, criteria. We've got our dear Professor, <laughs> Professor Wilma Leon, who can break it down to us. 
But uh, we see the progressive awakening, and those are the first steps. Now, Martin King called for revolution, as we know. At the end of his life, he wanted a fundamental transformation of wealth and power. He wanted a complete reinvigoration of public life and so forth. I think we've got a little ways to go there. But the beautiful thing is, and this is always the crucial first step, we're breaking the back of fear. See, once you're no longer fearful, then you're open to new possibility. But once you move further down the road, you're going to have to have a much sharper analysis of power. You're going to have to have better organizing, better mobilizing. You're going to have high-quality people, quality leadership, quality followership. And all of those remain open questions at the moment. We're going to run. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, so much. you so much. And that was uh, Cornell West, uh, exclusive interview that uh, myself uh, and uh, a reporter from WMNF did and just very exceptional uh, things he had to say. Uh, Connie, what did you think? <laughs> I think it was wonderful. I mean, what we are seeing now, um, like you said, is, it's a breakdown within the structure. And, of course, young people being mo- mobilized and determined to continue to tap at that well for uh, what he described as respect and power is what we have to keep this momentum going. And so I felt, you know, and I feel very encouraged by it. Yeah, I was uh, excited to have the opportunity to talk to him. Uh, he actually remembered me. Um, I've met him several times, including at uh, the Occupy Washington, D.C. And um, the I Have a Dream 50th Memorial last or two years ago and uh, at the Left Forum. So um, he, he's a very personable, real guy, too. That's what I like about him. And one of the interesting things about the um, From Montgomery to Memphis documentary was that very same thing you could see with Dr. King. And, you know, and it's really important we remember that uh, our prophets, if you will, not P-R-O-F-I-T-S, but prophets in the biblical sense, um, are very much real human beings who uh, struggle and desire to have the same kinds of things in life that we all do, but are willing to put their lives on the line. So I really appreciate it. I had the opportunity of participating with Cornell West in a demonstration that happened at the Supreme Court a few years ago where we actually crossed the line and actually got on the steps of the Supreme Court, which is illegal, by the way, and participated in a civil disobedience with him uh, the police uh, arrested several people and pepper sprayed several of us. And so it was quite a thing. Um, you know, what I think we'll do, Mark, if we could, is I want to, because we have a short time before we'll take a bottom of the hour break to make announcements. Uh, can you, uh, do you have the Beyond Vietnam excerpt right near you? Because I think we'll do that and then do the Cornell speech uh, after that. So this is uh, Dr. King's Beyond Vietnam speech and an excerpt from it that uh, I think is real significant, too, given what's going on today. Just a moment there. I put him on the spot, and uh, hopefully he's finding it. Um, I think uh, this speech is uh, just a real important speech that Dr. King made uh, that many have heard, but most in this country are not aware of. And uh, it was a speech he made at Riverside Church to the year before his death, uh, April 4th, 1967 is when he made it. And Connie, I'm sure you've heard it before, haven't you? Oh, yes, I have. Okay. And uh, you know what uh, struck me about that, uh, not just the speech, but I guess the reaction from the speech is how Dr. King found himself to be almost a man without an organization, how many inside of the African community, um, uh, we know the liberal press, if it's such a thing, turned against King. But within the bowels of his own organization, uh, because they felt like, you know, the concessions that Johnson had made, mainly to the black middle class, that should not be disturbed Dr. King understood and stated inside that speech 
that the war in itself was an enemy to the poor. Yeah. And so uh, as King laid out America war, thirst for war, uh, those that was from Thurgood Marshall to Roy Wilkerson, members, uh, president of the uh, NAACP, the Urban League, all of them turned their back on King. And so King was virtually left alone by himself uh, after he made that speech. Yes, and that happens too often to the prophets. So now here's yes. part of the speech uh, beyond Vietnam. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor and to attack it as such. Perhaps a more tragic recognition of reality took place when it became clear to me that the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. It was sending their sons and their brothers and their husbands to fight and to die in extraordinarily high proportions relative to the rest of the population. We were taking the black young men who had been crippled by our society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia which they had not found in southwest Georgia and East Harlem. And so we have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schools. And so we watch them in brutal solidarity burning the huts of a poor village, but we realized that they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago. I could not be silent in the face of such cruel manipulation of the poor. My third reason moves to an even deeper level of awareness, for it grows out of my experience in the ghettos of the North over the last three years, especially the last three summers. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they ask, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the changes it wanted. Their questions hit home, and I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government, oh. for the sake of those boys, for the sake of this government, for the sake of the hundreds of thousands trembling under our violence, I cannot be silent. For those who ask the question, aren't you a civil rights leader? and thereby mean to exclude me from the movement for peace. I have this further answer. In 1957, when a group of us formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, we chose as our motto to save the soul of America. We were convinced that we could not limit our vision to certain rights for black people, but instead affirmed the conviction that America would never be free are saved from itself until the descendants of its slaves were loose completely from the shackles they still wear. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, Connie, and we have a, another friend of mine who will be calling in momentarily. But I want to take this time out now to uh, make some announcements and uh, just tell you who we are and what we're all about. Uh, the Revolutionary Road Show is a production of the Revolutionary Caucus and Squatter Records. It is a radio show committed to promoting revolutionary radical ideas 
through political engagement, discussion, music, art, and culture. It's hosted by myself, Reverend Bruce Wright, Connie Burton, human rights and housing activist, uh, Crown Dion hip-hop artist locally here. We miss him. And, of course, his he is primarily our theme song, his uh, song that we hear most shows. And uh, my lovely wife, Bar- Barbara, I almost said Richards, <laughs> Barbara Wright, who is helping me with a lot of tech support. And, of course, we thank Mark at the uh, board for helping us out. Uh, I want to let you guys know who we're sponsored by. We're sponsored by the St. Petersburg Community Acupuncture. Special shout out to Greg. Uh, we are so grateful for St. Petersburg Community Acupuncture being a long-term supporter of us. They're located at 1624 Central Avenue, St. Petersburg, Florida. You can reach them at 727-823-1700. Again, St. Pete Community Acupuncture for all your alternative health needs, 1624 Central Avenue, St. Petersburg, Florida, 727-823-1700. Gennaro Coffee Company, 1047 Central Avenue host of St. Pete uh, for Peace Films, the St. Petersburg Catholic Worker. You can find them on Facebook. My Place in Recovery, Addictions, Recovery, and Thrift Store and Drop-In Center. That's My Place in Recovery, Addictions, Program, and Drop-In Center. 727-244-0427. That's 727-244-0427. And you can reach them at 1655 16th Street South. Uh, We get a little bit of background noise there, Mark. 1655 16th Street South is where my place in recovery is. And then the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. That's economichumanrights.org to check them out. The Ahu Solidarity Committee and uh, the Pinellas Greens, as well as the Students for a Democratic Society on the campus of St. Petersburg, Florida. Definitely want to Support Students for Democratic Society as they host next Thursday night at 7 p.m. on the campus in Davis 130. Uh, Rivera Sun, prolific author of the Dandelion Insurrection, who will be on our show next Monday night at 10 p.m. as she's also one of the leaders of the Center for Nonviolence. Look forward to having Rivera Sun on next week. Many other things coming up in the future. We'll let you know about them as they come closer. Again, thank you to all of our sponsors. If you wish to sponsor, you can check us out at 727-278-1547. You can contact me. And I want to let everyone know that this show is podcasted. Uh, You can go to www.tantalk1340.com to listen to the show, to watch the live stream, to get our podcast, or to find the TuneIn app. We're also on YouTube at the Revolutionary Road Radio Show. Again, uh, sponsored by or produced by the Revolutionary Caucus and Squatter Records. Well, as we are going to the beginning of our break there, uh, towards the end of it, we listened to a brief excerpt from Dr. King's Beyond Vietnam speech. And I have uh, on the air with me right now, of course, Connie Burton and my good friend Peter Rodriguez from the Big Apple. You there, Pete? I'm sure. I'm doing what we're doing this evening. Uh, how you doing, Pete? Hi, Pete. I'm doing beautiful. I'm beautiful. Pete. Wake up, Pete. So Pete's in the Big Apple. Uh, I'm sure there were some pretty major events that happened today around Dr. King. Is that right? Uh, yes. Uh, had a lot of, um, well, actually, I was at a, a march that we had at my school today. It was actually pretty good. It was pretty nice. We have a really uh, big turnout, as I thought it would, but... Uh, Speakers that were there, they were very pointed and speaking on the major points that Dr. King, you know, lived his life by. So I thought it was beautiful happening today. Uh, Pete, are you talking directly in the phone where we can hear you, but it's a little muffled? <laughs> yes, I am. Now we hear you better. Thank you. Better? Okay. Yeah. Share again, Pete. What was that? There, were, there was a march at your school. Tell them what uh, university you go to. I go to the university called Hunter College. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's one of the premier colleges in the United States. Actually, uh, one of our alumni just won an honor medal uh, from President Obama. Wow. So, are, are you going to get a medal, too? <laughs> I hope so, one day. <laughs> so, so you had a march there, and I'm sure there were a number of other marches going on. I, I, I'm wondering, uh, Pete, and, and also Connie, uh, as we listen to this uh, speech by Dr. King, 
uh, part of it. It was a much longer speech about beyond Vietnam and about the uh, military industrial complex and the whole idea of uh, us uh, going around and policing the world, so to speak, which actually was the opening song we played. It was talked about policing the world, which I thought was appropriate. And of course, especially in lieu of what's going on in Yemen now, which apparently uh, our puppet government has fallen apart there. I wonder what your thoughts are, because it seems to me that his speech so transcends time, it would be like he could say the same speech today, except maybe instead of Vietnam, put Yemen in there or Afghanistan or Iraq or whatever. What, what, what are your thoughts on that, Pete and, and Connie? Uh, you can go ahead first, Connie. Uh, well, you know, uh, Dr. King, like you said, hearing it then, um, looking at the conditions of the world now is appropriate. That speech would fit in right now because in one way that, that I, when I hear that speech, I'm always thinking about this thing he talking about, the, the uh, manipulation of the poor. So a lot of young people join the military for the sole purpose of lack of economic opportunities in their communities and their neighborhoods. And so that in itself bounds people who have a certain allegiance to the military because it, the military it, because it, it gives them an opportunity to have, you know, working income. But then what does it do? It then forges people to fight for uh, liberty, as King said, that the people don't have, you know, even in their own country. So you under this uh, uh, illusion, I mean, that you're fighting for liberty abroad, but when you get back home as an African American, you got stop and frisk. Uh, you got uh, stand your ground. <laughs> you got a, a court date. You know, you you bombarded with all of this injustice that you see here in this country. And yet, joining that institution, the uh, analysis that you uh, that you're fighting on this American democracy, uh, giving them something abroad that you don't have at home. So true, so true, and I appreciate uh, bringing that out not only in his speech, but you know, in your kind of contemporizing it. Really, his speech is timeless when it comes to this. What What are your thoughts, Peter? Pete. I totally agree with you, Bruce. Um, yes, he was way ahead of his time. Um, and I totally agree with Connie because um, I was also in the service. Uh, I was in the United States Army. And um, one of our base uh, foundations for going into was because of lack of opportunities and economic uh, things that I was going through at the time in my life. And um, mm-hmm. to be honest with you, when I was in it, when I was in the Army, I really hated it. But the fact that there was lack of, of jobs in my area and it, just the fact of the things that were going on in my life, you know, I felt like almost compelled and forced to, you know, join the service. Um, She's absolutely right, too. I I also agree with her as far as we go and we go and we fight for these, all these so-called democratic democracy in other, you know, countries and all that. And we come back to a place that doesn't even afford us the same things that they fool us into thinking that we're going over there abroad to fight for. So, I totally agree with Ms. Connie there. Well, thank you both. Um, you know, I, I really would encourage all of our listeners to uh, go onto YouTube and listen to the entire speech be- about uh, uh, Dr. King's uh, uh, speech about uh, Beyond Vietnam. And, and I think you'll get an earful that really will be an eye opener uh, as far as. Uh, how t- uh, transcendent his speech was in relation to war in, in general. Bruce, so, can I say one more thing? Yeah, please. You know, uh, when King says in that speech <laughs> that America would never be free and to those that uh, bear the shackles of, of slavery, have, I'm not, you know, I'm paraphrasing, still have this sense of bondage, it's so true. Because if all people, if all life is valued in this country, if we do not have public policies that attack individuals because of past uh, missteps, uh, we would have a reduction in social spending. 
we would have a uh, 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 less, uh, you know, human beings incarcerated. Uh, we wouldn't be uh, identified as being uh, the, the, the biggest nation that incarcerates uh, its human citizens the way the United States is. And all of this is a financial burden on America. It is a financial burden, but based on her stubbornness and the policymakers based on their projected hate and long-term hate against African people, this is why we can't get forward. We can't move forward. We don't have, like, one co- co- uh, like a cohesive uh, motion to, to, to save this nation because of this false sense of superiority that uh, the majority race still have toward African people. And so this is the debt America has. Well, I couldn't have said it better. I, I was just interrupted by, by uh, my wife. Apparently, there might have been some shooting at the MLK celebration tonight. I, I Crown posted it. Uh, I hope to find out more details. Um, it just underscores how we still have a long way to go, and especially with what you shared there, Connie and and Pete. And I appreciate that. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, play the beginning part now of Dr. Cornell West's speech, which includes some introductions from uh, the pastor at uh, Mount Zion AME Church, as well as uh, another gentleman who is a civil rights leader in his own right. And I'll let uh, Mark go ahead and play that for you. We're going to close the show out with that. I'll come on a minute or two to let you guys know what's uh, coming up next and to uh, sign off. But here is... Uh, the speech Dr. Cornell West did. And again, thank you both Connie and uh, Pete for your commentaries and thoughts. Pete is now a a new part of our program that you'll be hearing from and giving your perspective in another part of the country. So we're excited about that. Anyway, here is uh, Dr. Cornell West at Mount Zion AME Church in St. Petersburg, Florida, last Wednesday. Um, 
Howard in political science. Uh, he has a nationally syndicated radio program on uh, the urban view. I almost said the power. Uh, Channel 128, Dr. Wilma Leon. He will be our convener. And uh, if uh, you don't mind, we are going to ask you if you have questions. Uh, we're going to be circulating some index cards. Write your question on the card. The usher will take them up, and we will begin to process those cards, remove all the redundancy, and come with some questions from our community. Without Ladies and gentlemen, one of my 
your life. And it is truly an honor, for he is truly one of the best that Sacramento, California has to offer. One of Clifton and Ivy West boys. <laughs> Tell 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> so I'll be 
be here as long as the Lord wants to be. As long as the Spirit is in the place. Absolutely. But I do want to begin where my dear Brother Leon ended. It's really a fundamental confession. That is, I am who I am because somebody loved me. Somebody cared for me. Somebody tended to me. Zero in on me. And there will never be a higher title that I have had than being the that being the second son of the late Clifton West and the present day Irene West. So it's each and every one of you a privilege to meet both of them. I'll never be one half of the man my father was. Never. I'll never be one third of the human being my mother is. I have to live three lifetimes. Because I look at the world not in terms of what Alexander considers what is great, or what the mainstream considers what is great, but I look at the world through the lens of the cross. He who sees greatest among you will be your servant. What's the quality of your love for others? What's the quality of your service for the least of these who weaken the mind of the father? That was the beginning. That was... Okay, yes, that was the beginning of a series of speeches by Dr. Cornell West, uh, who spoke at uh, Mount Zion AME. You're going to hear more of that in the future. Again, I want to thank Connie Burton for being on with me, as always. Peter Rodriguez from uh, the Bronx in New York for being on. Mark, thank you for doing our tech support. And, of course, my lovely wife, Barbara Wright, whose birthday is tomorrow, January 20th. Shout out to her. And uh, next week, we will have Rivera San, prolific author of The Dandelion Insurrection. Stay tuned to more Tan Talk, Spectrum 360 following us. This is the Revolutionary Road radio show. Thank you for listening. <laughs>